you talked very positively about 2015 global growth. What is driving that growth? Well, I mean, there's one structural factor that I've, I've talked about in, for 10 years. That the, I've been at the conference for 10 years, and I've always talked about emerging markets because a lot of people don't understand that the world really has changed. It's not about Europe, North America, Japan anymore. It's more and more about China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, other emerging markets. So that's the, that's the core driver. That's where the, the really high growth rates are taking place from a smaller base, but they're half the world now. So think about the world where the rich old countries are starting to get a little bit more feeble and their growth is not strong, and the growth is really happening in emerging markets. But I would argue that the swing variable that's, that's picking up the world right now is the US recovery. It's been almost six years since the financial crisis, and America is finally showing signs of a stable recovery in the private sector private consumption, auto consumption, housing sector, investment, all that's growing better. And that's good news because we're kind of hanging on to America's coattails here in Canada. And you mentioned the self-reliance uh, on energy in the U.S. going yep. up as well. Is that something we should be concerned about? Well, I think everybody in this country should be aware of it because we've done really well for the last decade. I mean, we could debate the impact of a higher exchange rate on manufacturing. Clearly, it's had a, a kind of a negative impact on southern Ontario and Quebec. But for the most part, all of us have benefited from high commodity prices and our ability to sell what we take out of the ground here to the Americans. The truth is, in the last two or three years, America's now um, extracting a million barrels a day more than they were in, say, 2011-12. And some analysts see that growing, growing, growing to the point where America's energy imports are going to get cut in half over the next five years. Now, that obviously matters because we basically sell the one market, the United States. So now's the time where we got to get those pipelines planned uh, through the regulatory approval process and working if we're going to tap into the Asian, European and other markets around the world for energy. And is there self-reliance growth because of new technologies in the energy industry? Yeah, the same technologies that we're using in the oil sands or to do tertiary recovery here in Alberta, um, the Americans are using. So a combination of fracking, shooting in water to increase the pressure and horizontal drilling where you can drill you know, miles uh, sideways basically to extract energy. And they've now taken the technology, applied it in both gas and now in oil. So the Bakken field, which is just south of the line, south of the, sort of the southeast corner of Saskatchewan, is where the Bakken field is in North Dakota. It's now being exploited in a way that it was never exploited before. Switching gears and over to Europe, it's not growing quite as quickly. Well, yeah, Europe's recovering, but it's not really impressive recovery. I mean, Europe's been in a mess the last few years. They've gone through banking crisis, too much public debt. The Germans have bailed out the Greeks. Um, they've tried to resolve the, the banking system. So things are stable now, and that's allowed Europe to hit bottom and grow. But the growth is really feeble. I mean, growth of less than 1% in France or Spain or Italy is a recovery, but boy, that, I mean, usually when you get a recovery, you get a year or even 18 months of kind of overfilling growth, growth of three, four, five percent. That's not happening because there's really serious structural problems in Europe, and the north and south there are quite different. So Germany's growing at two percent. Uh, the Netherlands, Austria, Belgium, they're all in pretty good shape, whereas the southern Europeans are really in rough shape, and the south starts in France, which has gone from being a partner with Germany so it's starting to fade in terms of their influence and status within Europe. Is this going to pose a challenge for our like our trade agreements, like CETA, for example? Well, I mean, CETA is almost, almost done now. We're getting more and more information that they're, they're, they're wrapping up all the technical details. CETA will be signed. It's going to take a long time to get it ratified, though. So that's message number one. CETA doesn't happen overnight. It'll take 18 months to two years for all the individual EU countries to ratify. And of course, each, each province in Canada has to see the deal as well. No, I would argue that CETA is good because it's going to get rid of the tariff on beef products and other products and give us access to a rich market of half a billion consumers. But it's not a growth market. So we can maybe win market share away from others. But pe people shouldn't expect it to be growing at 7% like China. Yeah, so we're talking back to focusing on emerging markets. Maybe. And that's why emerging markets become the story, because that's where the growth is. I mean, ideally, we want to diversify our trade with the rest of the world rely less on the Americans, more on everybody else, while maintaining the U.S. as a market. But the growth is happening in emerging markets. Now, we
we can see on the screen sort of a red flash every now and then, and we're going to get to your book, but first, um, we mentioned the Conference Board of Canada. What is it? I, I think that there's sort of, uh, some people don't understand okay. what the Okay, so we are an independent, not-for-profit, evidence-based, non-partisan think tank, which is basically a business research organization. We have no endowment. We go, don't get money from the feds, the provinces, anybody else. We're basically selling our, our brain power, selling services to the economy, to whether it's the farm community, uh, provincial governments, major corporates. Everybody who values our research pays a price for it, and hopefully they're getting good value for money out of it. And so now we can talk about your book. What is okay. it? Oh, well, the book is called Power Play, The Business Economics of Pro Sports, and it was kind of a fun Sunday afternoon project over a few years where a colleague and I, we were both good athletes but not good enough to become pros. So we had that kind of passion and then went to grad school, became economists. Well, 20 years later, I found the time and the, the appetite to take some ideas and write them down. So it's, it's basically a, a labor of love over many weekends, and it's our attempt to build, can I talk like an economist? An analytical structure. So we built a framework to understand why pro sports franchises succeed or not. And it's built on looking at the community first, then the league's operating conditions, and then the owner and management of the franchise. And we cover things like who should pay for pro sports facilities, uh, revenue sharing, all sorts of factors like that. And it was just a lot of fun to write. And it's available on Amazon? It's available on Amazon, five bucks. So if you have a Kindle, because in fact, when you put stuff on Amazon, you have to choose the, the platform. We chose Kindle. Five dollars or hard copy from the conference port. Um, you know, you can find an email on our website. Twenty bucks. Awesome. <laughs> Plus shipping. Yeah. Okay. So twenty-five bucks. Well, something like that. A little that. more than the Kindle version. But it was a fun project, and it shows that economics can really be applied to almost anything. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your presentation today and for your interview. Good. It was great fun.